Hi all, uh, starting in time this week for the, or this month for the first time in ages. Uh, we've got a couple of people here in the office in Dublin. We have Emmanuel here uh, to give his presentation on biome. But just before we do that, we have a little surprise that we are going to uh, present here first of all. Oh. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> so change oh, the slide. Yeah, I'm not sure actually how to change the slide. One sec. Yeah, I was expecting more crowd, but... <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I don't know how to change the slides, can you do it without it? Yeah, no <laughs> problem. <laughs> and you will never send that. So, I don't work with Rust, but um, I'm very involved in JavaScript, and we ran a conference here in Dublin last uh, week, sorry, last month, and we did some awards for people involved in JavaScript and open source and things like that. Um, there was eight awards, we gave them all of them, but unfortunately Amanuela wasn't there. <laughs> so I just tried to find some opportunity to give it to him with some kind of recognition. So <laughs> today is the day. Uh, so here's the award. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> so ah, thank you. <laughs> it's <laughs> thank you. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah, I wanted to, to come with uh, a yesterday t shirt that you gave me. Oh, the yeah, but I couldn't find it. I think it was uh, <laughs> dry. You're good. Just you. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Let's start. Everyone. So, I mean, you just already uh, spoiled uh, who I am, <laughs> but... Uh, okay, so uh, my name is Emanuele Stoppa. You can call me Emma. If you can spell my name, it's fine. Everybody calls me Emma. Uh, I'm a serious senior software engineer. I've uh, been doing this for 12, 10 years. can't remember anymore. <laughs> and uh, I currently work uh, in the Astro Technology Company. Astro, that's the logo. If you don't know Astro, Go check it out. It's an amazing meta framework. Uh, you can do a lot of stuff. I love open source, and today I'm going to talk um, about Biome, uh, which is uh, software uh, built in Rust. I am currently the lead maintainer of Biome. Uh, it's a tool chain for web projects, uh, so anything that involves JavaScript, CSS, Markdown. So that's the aim that we we have in mind, we, are in, we don't cover everything yet, but that's the, the big plan. At the moment, Biome is able to format and analyze your code. It's really fast, and as I said, it's built in Rust. Now, presentation is over. Let's go with the code <laughs> really quick. All right, so what we're going to explore in this uh, meetup. So I'm going to show you uh, Biome's parser, so the foundations uh, of the parser, and why it's different from the usual parsers that uh, you might know already. We're going to do go a deep dive in the formatter, something that you might not know. Uh, you know parser, compilers, all this kind of stuff. Maybe not formatter, so maybe it's a good chance to understand what's behind it. And then we're going to talk about problem solution that we had in this big tool chain and how we solve them, common problems that you might, might know already, but I mean, let's see how we solve them. All right, so let's start with the parser. So the parser uh, has uh, four big foundations. The big fun uh, first foundation is the, uh, um, this concept of green and red trees. I'm gonna check later what, what is that. Then we're gonna talk about CST and what's different from the AST. And then what's a recoverable parser and what's an area resilient parser. All right, so what's a CST? So CST stands for concrete syntax tree. It's a kind of a, a brother of the EST. It works uh, in a, in a similar way, but the CST is meant to collect all the information inside the program. So 
everything, uh, not just code, but also trivia. And trivia are like comments, uh, white spaces, tabs, so everything that you have inside the program. Uh, and if you don't know it, uh, the majority of the parsers that work on the IDEs use the CST because they need to have everything and know everything about your program. So the CST, um, it's uh, something that um, it's quite uh, well known in the compiler um, ecosystem. And we decided to support the CST by using row one. So row one is um, a crate that pumps Rust analyzer. <coughs> if you don't know it, Rust analyzer is the official LSP uh, of Rust for v, uh, VS Code. And they use this crate and we forked it. So we have a f an internal fork in Biome and we extended it after we had a chat with the creator of, uh, of row one and it is suggested to actually uh, make a fork because uh, row one is actually meant for the IDEs so, and we, are, we actually extended it. So it's gonna work also for uh, CLIs and uh, mutations and, and so on. Um, so check it out. Um, it's a really tiny and actually it's called row one because it's after the name of a tree that has uh, green leaves and red um, uh, berries and that's because it supports this pattern called green tree and red tree so this pattern is a pattern that was um, firstly uh, created by uh, the Roslyn project so the Roslyn project is the name the code name of the C sharp compiler um, the green tree is essentially a structure of your program okay it saves all the information of your program using the cst although it's an immutable uh, data structure so uh, once it's created you can't actually uh, change it and it saves the information of your program of your program using the width so this is an example of uh, the cst that we have in uh, in biome and as you can see uh, the program uh, it's actually if you see, check the var the var has a width of 0 4 and the equals as a width of 6 8 this means that we actually save only the, the the basic information and then all the subsequent information that we need are computed when they actually requested an example are columns and um, rows enters the red tree. So the red tree is a computer data structure that comes from this, uh, the green tree. It's uh, mutable. Uh, it, it provides APIs to navigate uh, uh, the tree of your nodes. Uh, it, from the tree, uh, from the red tree, you, you can compute any information that you, that you need. And it is disposed at the end uh, of your operations. So this is a, not actually uh, the red tree, but if you check, there's a kind of a difference where the nodes are given a better name and they are better grouped. Uh, but codi coding wise, you actually have all the APIs to navigate, like uh, to access the await token, uh, the kind token, uh, then you can go to the children. So all these operations are done via Red Tree APIs provided by Roman. Then we talk about uh, a recoverable and error resilient parser. So this kind of parser is a, a parser that is able to actually uh, recover from the errors. So most of the times when you have a, a program and you have a, a syntax error, your parser just doesn't do anything, just throws you an error and say, oh, token, uh, expected token or uh, unexpected or whatever. And that's it. What can you do? <laughs> a recovery parser is a parser that once it encounters the error, it continues to parse regardless of what was the error. And then it tries to resume the parsing 
based on the context. So the, re the resumability of the parsing is, a kind, is not uh, a well-known science. So the better is your parser and the context that you're parsing, the better is uh, like, uh, the better it recovers, okay? But th the fact is that we are able to construct uh, a tree even for broken uh, programs that are syntactically incorrect. Okay, I should be able to, yeah, to, to show you some example. Okay, so this is a, uh, actually source code that we have uh, in Biome, okay? So everything starts from tokens. So we define tokens where we expect uh, to recover, like, uh, okay, so there was a missing comma, and then uh, after the, a bracket, then I can resume the parsing and know that I was like uh, in a body of the function, for example. So essentially we define a set of tokens and then we pass them to this data structure called the parser recovery. Uh, then we pass this bogus node. So all the tokens and nodes that belong to a broken syntax, they will then store in this ge generic bogus token. This is also another term that we borrowed from Roslyn and Swift. So uh, we pass the, the, um, the tokens that we should recover from. So once we encounter one of these tokens, okay, you can recover itself. And then uh, it returns uh, an actual result and it gives us a marker with range. And then uh, if it's not, it wasn't able to, to recover, well, we just uh, move on. And that's how it works, the recovery function. So this is always a source code directly from our parser. Uh, it's quite straightforward. There's, there's nothing complex here. Just like, you know, it's essentially you just Keep eating tokens, and so if you have an end of file, you just recover, or if you already recovered, uh, just return this variant. And then, as you can see, we have a, a loop. It says, until you recover, you just bump in. You bump in is essentially eat whatever token you find, okay? And then we have this recovered, so this function here at line 23, it's uh, this one line uh, 39. Here we have the recovery set uh, that we passed before, that we saw before, the end of token and some other uh, goodie like you can recover on line break. This is a, like a, a language specific thing. Okay, so that's essentially how we do it. Now I also want to show you uh, some functions inside uh, the biomes parser. So all the functions that parse syntax in biome use a, a single enum. And this is the enum. So each function has a return and this enum called, enum called par parse syntax, which has two variants, absent and present. So it's like op, uh, a result or an option. So it's very similar. And that's why we also have a function that you might have already seen and then which is uh, from the option uh, type. So if we don't have, uh, if we have some syntax, then uh, execute uh, the, the function, the operation function. But then we're also able to, to do more advanced stuff. So for example, we have this or add diagnostic. So we want to execute the function in case we have a piece of syntax that it was supposed to be uh, mandatory, and then since it's not there, it's absent, we actually want to create an error. And that's how we do it. So we call this ORAD diagnostic. We pass a function and uh, actually, yeah, a function that is, uh, is actually creates uh, the error and we pass the range uh, to that closure. And we also have a recover. So that's how we do it. So we create that parse recovery that we saw before. We pass it to this or recover. And we call this function only when we don't have the syntax. Presumably it, it created an error, it's gonna create an error, but we also want to recover from there. And we'll continue to have a decent parsing. And that's how we do it. So we execute the recover function 
and we do a match uh, with what returned. Obviously, it's an error regardless um, of what happened because we are recovering from a, an error and then we return an OK and an error and then the function is going to do whatever it needs to do. So all this, what does it mean? OK, so I'm going to show you some uh, neat examples. So we're actually working on the CSS parser. And this comes from an actual uh, source code. So if you go to in our playground and you write this, actually, no, the playground doesn't have CSS yet. But I, I, I did it <laughs> in a, on my laptop. So as you can see, this is a, a broken syntax, something like this. Uh, it's not uh, valid in CSS. But you see what we, we were able to emit. We were able to actually emit two nodes called the CSS class selector, where the first one has a missing name, as you can see here. But still, we were able to parse the second one, which is a valid one. Here's another example. Oh, actually, sorry. This is actually the error emitted uh, for the syntax. So even though we recovered, uh, we still emit a diagnostic saying, oh, listen, we were expecting an identifier, but we actually found a dot. For JavaScript, this is another example. So here, there's a missing comma between F and B. Uh, but still, as you can see, we were able to actually create two uh, string literal expression with the correct value. And we just have this missing operator. And that's it. And that's the error that we, we emit. So as you can see, uh, having this kind of uh, recoverability, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not a science, so it's a guess game. As you can see, the error is not what you expected. Maybe you would expect it like uh, add a comma, you know, to fix it. But these are functions that are really generic. So to, we use them to, to parse different cases. So sometimes we try to, to guess what the user was trying to, to type. So that's what uh, we had in the parser. There wasn't much because, you know, parser, we know that. So now I want to focus on the formatter. So what's a formatter? Well, <laughs> it formats your code, uh, quite simple. It can't emit broken syntax, so this is actually very important, and it can change the semantic of your program, because that's not a formatter, that's uh, a linter or whatever you want to call it. And also it's actually a very complex piece of software, more complex than a parser probably because there's a, there isn't uh, like a lot of knowledge out there, like books and everything about the formatter. So something said about the biomes formatter. So it's pretty years compatible. So when we created, we tried to, to create a formatter th that uh, format size pretty year to increase adoption because Prettier is the de facto uh, formatter of the, uh, the web world. So in order to you know, ease the transition from Prettier to Biome, you, know, you want to have a, not all the, your code changed. You know, it's not that great. Uh, it uses an IR, uh, which we, uh, we'll see to, uh, later what is it, to format the code. And it's able to format broken code because of what we saw before. So we are, uh, since we are able to actually emit always um, a, a tree of, uh, of nodes, we are actually able to get them and format it. And it formats code from left to right. We'll, we'll see later what, what it means for a formatter. So if you are interested more about the, the theory that is behind the prettiest formatters, there's a, a link here. Uh, that explains um, the heuristics and uh, all the theory behind uh, the, uh, the formatter. So first of all, what's an AR? So IR stands for Intermediate uh, Representation. It's a essentially data structure that using some program, usually the compiler or the code gen or whatever, transformer, that is able to interpret that, that and do operations. And we do that a formatter. So we create this data structure from the 
the CST, and then we give it uh, to this other program called Printer that is able to, inter to understand this IR and do the formatting. Now, let's start with the, with the IR. So, given this var A, uh, yeah, well, we, we should be able to see. So, uh, we have a group, for example, so the group is an IR and its content is var A. Then we have a literal, and then we have a, a R line break. Simple. But then you have something like this, and you get this big IR. As you can see, there's a lot of groups. So group is actually an important piece of uh, IR in the formatter. We have uh, some indentation, instructions, um, line break of space. There's also like the ifs, so like uh, if you if you go multiple lines, do something, otherwise do something else. So it's quite clever. And as uh, I told you, uh, we're able to format a broken code. So if you if you give this piece of code, which is broken because it, it doesn't have a name and the class name is mandatory, we actually get this uh, this other verbatim. Um, uh, IR, which means format as is, don't do anything. Okay. If you give it to Prettier, that's what you get. You get a parser error. So, we're really proud of what we can do. Although it's not, you have to opt in with this feature. Okay, so I want to show you some IR. So, IR for the format are basically instructions. It's essentially do this, don't do that. They have a quite uh, understandable names, so soft line break, hard line break, uh, a group. Uh, the group is an IR that says, tries to fit everything in one line, but then if this line uh, exceeds the width um, that you have uh, configured, everything has to go multiple lines. So that's what a group does usually. Um, and then we have these last uh, instructions that essentially work together with a group, you know. So if you are on a single line, uh, I don't know, print something. Uh, for example, this if uh, group breaks, we usually use it when uh, you have an object with uh, various keys and, and then it goes on multiple lines. So we want to use this one at the last item to add the comma. So we add the comma, so you can just do copy paste and you can continue adding um, uh, other items on multiple lines. Okay, so we, we saw the IR. Now we, we're gonna check how this IR is actually created in the Rust code. So we have this big enum that we call format element. And it has essentially um, IRs that are really similar to what we saw. So we have a space, uh, we have a line with a line mode, and the line mode uh, can be uh, as a other variants. Uh, we have this line suffix boundary that we usually use it to put comments. So usually uh, we call it boundary because if there is a comment, essentially you, do, you can't put any more code there. You have to go on a new line, and we also have this tag. I'm going to check now what's a tag. So a tag is essentially uh, a way to tell to the printer, listen, between the start of this tag at the end of this tag, there's a particular syntax that you have to apply. An example is actually the group. The group is a particular piece of IR and the printer has to do something quite uh, different from uh, a normal printing. And that's highlighted here. And then, and then that's the another important um, IR that we saw before is the verb item. It's essentially keep everything as is. Don't do anything. Neither don't add the lines. Keep everything as you as you have uh, in the content. Okay. So, but we don't actually use. Um, uh, this enum directly. We actually have helper functions inside the code to help 
the actual developer to write uh, functions. So as you can see, we have a soft line breaks that it creates an enum in a so, uh, line mode soft. We also have a hard line break, uh, hard line break of space, all this kind of stuff. We also have text, as you can see, and uh, oh, apologies here, and this is the group. So that's how we define the group. It's actually a struct uh, with some content. We give also an ID for some particular uh, cases and also if it should expand. So these are particular instructions, quite complex, but that's how we create a group. Okay, and this is actually an example of how we do the formatting. So uh, for the formatter is trait based. So we have a bunch of traits and this is the trait that we use to actually format nodes. So uh, we all the nodes that we have in our syntax are going to implement this format node and they have to implement these format field functions. We, uh, as an example, so this is uh, this node is JS uh, for variable declaration. So this is the actual node that you have in a for loop when you have to declare the, the, the index, so let i whatever. So that's the actual node. So we get an await token, the kind, uh, and uh, the declarator. So await token is uh, optional, so it's a, it is an action option. So if we have it, we form it, and then we add the space. And then uh, we have a group. So with the group, we tell that, uh, as we, I told you before, if you go, you are really long, you go on multiple lines. And, and then we just do print the kind, print the, a space, and the declarator. So the kind is actually const var or let, and the declarator is the, the actual value. This is another example for the JSON. So the JSON object, as you can see, it's more uh, complex. So it, it gets complex quite uh, very, very quickly. Um, this is, uh, so before I told you that the formatter actually prints from left to right. So this is actually not, uh, it should not be taken for granted because in the formatter, when you actually want to uh, format something, you have to expect all the nodes that you have. Uh, uh, you know, even you have to actually go forward and check children and uh, grandchildren in order to understand the layout that you want to print. So, and when you want to do that, you actually risk to to print ahead, to go too much ahead, and then print what you saw and then pipe it to to what you had. In order to avoid that, we have all these uh, helper functions that are uh, that accept um, closures. So this format width is actually used anywhere in almost every uh, code of the formatter. And it just basically says via closure, we actually uh, able to expect, and it's all, that all done by reference. So we don't need to take ownership of everything. So it's very <laughs> easy in that sense, and we were able to actually print a list uh, before, even though it's not still printed, and then pass the list down here or down here. Um, so in this case, as you can see, we also check for comments. So comments is another pain point for the formatter. Uh, we borrowed the exact uh, heuristic that Prettier does. And so here to, to uh, make it simple, if you have a, a leading comment uh, in your list, just extract it from the list and pour it before the group. So um, heuristic is uh, like uh, certain rules where uh, we decide where a comment should be placed in a certain node. And if we, if we notice that the comment is not where it's supposed to be, we actually take it and we move it to where it's supposed to be. So sometimes you might see that your formatter, Prettier or Biome, actually moves um, your comment in another place because that's the, the heuristic that K 
kicks in. We're not going to check out the comments is done because it's quite complex. Uh, but if you want to check it, uh, go to the source code. <laughs> okay, so pretty yeah, yeah, Rust. So as as I told you, uh, the internal code is quite complex, and it actually went under three uh, rewrites. So uh, myself and Mia, we actually more Mia, but. We work on this uh, formatter and it took a lot of time and we formatted three times. Eventually we landed to um, an implementation uh, that is very similar to Rust format. So the core is actually borrowed from the Rust format and it's, uh, we use the trait system to implement the format of all the nodes as you noticed before. And we also created APIs and functions that are really the reminds the the standard format uh, library from Rust. You might have already noticed something, but now we're gonna show it. Uh, gonna show it more. So, first of all, we have this trait called format, which is essentially the the foundation. All right. So we have this. Trait format with uh, this function called for, uh, FMT. It takes self and a mutable formatter. So, which is essentially the, the same uh, signature that you get from debug and display when you want to implement it. So, it's exactly the same. So, uh, it reminds of that. So, we use the same uh, signatures. So, it's actually very familiar. And then we uh, return a result because. Uh, since we have a broken syntax, a broken syntax uh, might be an error, so we have to uh, throw that error to, to the parent. Now, here, here's the, the funny thing. I don't know if you know the orphan rule in Rust. Yeah, so we had to deal uh, with, this, with this rule. So for people that know it, the orphan rule says that uh, you can't implement uh, a trait uh, on a on a type if neither of these two uh, if actually the type is not created uh, inside the, cr the, the the actual crate so why we had this problem we had this problem because we have a crate called biome formatter which is essentially the generic formatter and then we have this uh, the syntax so all the nodes that belong to uh, a language, uh, CSS, JS, they, they are a, an actual, another crate. And then we have biome JS formatter or biome JSON formatter, which, a third, which is a third crate. And if we, if we try to actually implement the format for uh, a, JSON, a JSON object value, Rust is going to complain and say, oh, you can't do that, <laughs> forbids you. And how we solve this issue? So, we solve this issue by creating new traits. So it's a bit of verbose, uh, but that's how we, how we did it. So we created a couple of uh, traits called into format and as format to actually uh, have a mutable and a reference. And a as you can notice here, we have uh, this type that has to return the biome formatter format. So that's how we work around uh, the, the orphan rule. Then we have the formatter. So if we go back, we notice this formatter, and that's actually this one. So formatter is a struct that has inside the buffer. So that's essentially what it is. Although the buffer is not a type, is actually another trait. <laughs> so, and that's how um, oh yeah, so essentially, uh, this actually source code the formatter. So we have the new, we have the options, context. So uh, you know, options are like line width, uh, space or tabs. Uh, so this kind of stuff. Uh, context is another internal data structure, which we don't need to see uh, right now. But as you can see, we we actually expose functions to actually borrow it or actually take a uh, mutable reference. And then we have this join uh, right here. So a join is actually uh, a data structure that uh, creates a builder. So 
you know this builder pattern and is actually useful for when you have to want to format a list so you have an array you have your list of items uh, you want to actually push and format while uh, you iterate over them so and that's how we do it so we actually have this f join and then there's entry dot entry dot entry and at the end you have the finish so kind of reminds of uh, this builder pattern that is actually quite uh, popular in the in the rust world and then we have the buffer so the buffer as you not uh, you saw uh, it was a trait and that's how we use it so we have actually a vector uh, that we call the vec, vec buffer it actually implements uh, the buffer a trait and that's how we actually use it so we have this write macro which is essentially the, <laughs> the same macro that you that we have in the standard library so as you can see it's very familiar uh, to use uh, the internal formatter we pass a buffer and then a list of arguments and that's how it's uh, how the macro is defined we have these internal uh, format arguments uh, data structure uh, it uses some pointers and other technique that we borrowed from the Rust format. Uh, great. So that's essentially how we actually format. And as you noticed, since it's all a trait system, you actually can format anything uh, as long as your, dit your type uh, implements these, uh, these traits. And that's the back buffer. So the back vec buffer, it has uh, a vector of format element and a state. And this is the actual implementation of the buffer. So the way, as you notice, it, the, there isn't like, uh, like uh, uh, a complex uh, data structures in these types. Uh, it's just uh, a lot of trait system uh, to be able to actually arrive to something more uh, enjoyable to, to use. So we had to sweat and uh, suffer a lot to achieve that, but uh, the actual result is very nice. We also have a snapshot system. Uh, Sometimes this is needed. Uh, there are some complex um, layouts in Prettier where you start printing something, but then you have to revert because of some heuristics. And that's why we had uh, the snapshot uh, feature. Um, so yeah, so that's actually <laughs> all the internals, uh, not all of them. There are actually also some other parts um, that weren't that important, but this is actually the core uh, of the formatter. And then we have the printer. So the printer is the actual uh, program that takes uh, the result. So a vector of format elements. OK, so that, that's what we, gave, we give uh, to the printer. Uh, it has some options. It has state. Um, these are the options. So uh, in the, the indentation, uh, the width, uh, the the kind of line ending, like, like carriage return or you know, the windows also one, so indentation style. And that's the state. So we have a bunch of uh, uh, internal information that are needed to the printer in order to, to do its job. And so this is an example of uh, a function that we have. Uh, I'm not going to explain to you what it does. But I just want to show you at the end what what's the implementation look like, which is actually a match, as you can, as you can see. So we give an, uh, we have uh, this print element. We pass the actual element as a reference. Uh, we have a queue and a stack, and then we just do the match, and then there's a lot of logic uh, uh, based on state configuration. Um, uh, so <laughs> that's, that's essentially it. This is actually source code, uh, copy pasted. As you see, there's a lot of going on because we have a lot of variants 
uh, if you remember, we had also that tag that had a lot of uh, variants. Uh, it, it, it gets long very easy. <laughs> okay, so I think that's it. Uh, that's supposed to be the demo time, but we'll do it later. Okay. okay. Uh, something that uh, that uh, you so if you don't know it, I want to mention rough. Uh, Charlie made the talk about it a uh, couple of months, ago, th three months ago. So Raf launched, uh, announced their formatter uh, last night, and the formatter is actually uses bio a fork of Biome under the hood. So uh, because the actual creator Miha uh, actually now works uh, in Astral, the company that uh, develops. Um, uh, rough and uh, is the owner. He knows the code, and they essentially forked it. They made uh, some optimizations that we can't do uh, due to Prettier's uh, constraints, and and then they implemented it. Uh, as we saw, they they have a bunch of uh, Python nodes or whatever they need, and and they did it. And uh, I mean, if you check the the, the demo, is actually fast. But uh, we're gonna see also biome how fast it is. All right, so, okay. Now I wanna show you, uh, talk about some problems that uh, we had in some areas of the tool chain and how we solved it. So multi-threading, the usual one, uh, testing file system, how we did it, uh, a CLI that can't panic, and this workspace that I'm gonna tell you later what it is. So uh, we use multi-threading. Um, we spawn a thread for each file that we encounter. And then we have another thread where we send within channels all the messages. Like I'm handling this file and uh, it's a success. I managed to, to, to handle it. Or oh, there's a parsing error. Here's the, the error. So essentially that's the, 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 the channel and the thread that we use to, to send the messages. And then we have this traverse inputs uh, function. I'm gonna show you now what it does, but we pass the file system, uh, the inputs that are actually the paths that we pass via CLI and some options via reference. And what we do is essentially start a traversal and for each traversal, you spawn a thread and we pass that traversal option to the thread via reference. This is a, uh, this fs.traversal is a function that comes from the file system, okay? So what is the problem? So I'm not sure if you notice that traversal option, that is actually a reference. So when working on a multi-threading and this, and we have lifetimes, that comes actually complex uh, because the compiler sometimes can make mistakes and interpret these lifetimes in a way that shouldn't be. And in Biome, what was the problem? That if we try to use the lint function and pass the context, and then we try to actually uh, reuse that context as it's a reference, so we could potentially do it. It was actually saying, oh, you can't do that because uh, lint actually takes ownership and the lifetime uh, is not valid anymore, so you can't do that. But it's not, it's not true. How we solve the issue with this little guy, the phantom, phantom data? So first I want to show you uh, what's the traversal option. As you can see, there are actually two lifetimes. One is the app, so we have a when we start up the CLI, we have this app that owns everything. And then we have this context that is actually the context of our thread, okay? Thing is, we, we want to tell, uh, in a way we want to tell the compiler, listen, it's safe to do this operation. We can pass uh, to multiple functions in the same scope, uh, these traversal options. Okay. And that's how we did it. So we created 
a second uh, data structure, which is actually a tiny wrapper that holds a reference to the options. And then we use the phantom data to hold the actual lifetime. So when you have problems with lifetimes and you're not able to, to tell the compiler, listen, look, this is a valid operation. Uh, the reference is still valid. You just use the phantom data to tell in, uh, to the compiler to cheat. You know, it's actually a, a valid workaround. And then we implemented the, the DREF uh, for, to actually return uh, the inner. And then we were able to actually do something like that. So you must create always a reference, so you can't create uh, ownership. So you have to do uh, something like this. But then we were actually able to, to use the shared context and use it in multiple functions uh, without having the compiler complaining. But that's one problem that we solved. Another one is testing the file system operation. So uh, this is actually tricky. Uh, sometimes you don't do that. You just assume that actually, I mean, uh, the standard library, uh, it's quite good uh, in handling all you know, Windows and things like, and Linux, all this debacle. Thing is, you want to actually, uh, you know, test your CLI, you know, you want to pass a file or use a, a certain uh, configuration and see the actual result, you know, you want to test it. And thing is, it can trick you, but with Rust, we just use a, a trait system. So this is actually uh, our, traits, uh, our trait. We called it a uh, file system. Uh, we set send sync a ref min, so we are able to actually pass it safely between threads and share uh, share it among threads. Tra uh, threads, yes. And it has to also be uh, a safe. So, so also all those operations can't panic. So we have a bunch, um, some of these functions. We have also other functions, but like we have the traversal that we saw before. Um, here, I'm gonna show it to you. Yeah, so that's the one, okay which it actually does the actual traversal. So we have two implementations, one for the OS and one for the, the memory. And then we have uh, the trait file, okay? So uh, we implemented uh, the file system for the operating system. So it uses normal paths, we check metadata, if it's a symbolic link, a file, a folder, all the usual stuff. And then we created the memory file system where which we use it to test our CLI. Here gets a little bit uh, out of hand with the, <laughs> the type assertion with the types. So for example, the files, it's a Nash map of path buff and file entry. It has to, it has to have um, a lock because all the operations have to be thread safe, but all the functions have the reference self signature. So we need to use this type. And then since we had the, the reference, uh, ref, ref and win safe, we have to tell the compiler, listen, also the files. Um, so it, this is mandatory to actually uh, tell the compiler, listen, the operations are safe. And then we have uh, the a memory file. Uh, we use uh, Rayon uh, to lock uh, and manage uh, the files internally. Uh, these are types that come from Rayon, so we don't use uh, the standard library in this case. And I think there's also, a, so that's an example of our testing. So what we do, we actually create the, fi the file system, we create the path, and then we insert a path there. So insert actually is a, is a function of this type. It doesn't come from uh, the trait. And then we have this function run CLI, and that's how we pass it uh, to, uh, to the actual app and uh, the, the CLI. 
we use this type called uh, dynamic ref. So dynamic ref is, a is like a cow uh, that holds a reference to a string or owns actual st uh, capital string. That's really similar. So it, uh, it has two variants, one for a borrowed mutable uh, reference and one, the other variant, when it owns uh, the file system. So in the actual app, we have dynamic ref uh, owned. But for the CLI, when we test it, we actually pass a mutable reference. So we actually able to do more assertions like uh, what's inside the file, what's been written, how's the, the formatting. Uh, uh, in some cases, we actually able to extract the content and do assertions like the content is supposed to be like this. So that's how we solved it. Perfect, that, and that's another problem that we had. So when you do the traversal and uh, you deal with the file system, there, there might be a lot of errors coming up that aren't expected. Uh, permissions or, I don't know, file corrupted or uh, a symbolic link that is recursive. So there's a bunch of things that could go wrong. Thing is, uh, you actually, you actually see a lot. You can't panic uh, like this. You have to actually deal with errors uh, in a safe way. And that's how we did it. So we have the end of file, um, which is a function that is run uh, during the traversal. And we use the catch and wind. So the catch and wind is a popular function that you actually use to, to catch panics or unex unhandled errors that can occur uh, in this function in this case. And, and that is a bunch of, so usually uh, this process file returns a file status. It's a double okay, so there's a, there's a lot of going on, uh, but that's when we actually deal uh, with the error. And if we actually panic, uh, then we have this diagnostic called panic diagnostic. Uh, but this function is actually safe. So even if we have panics and they I, I saw this happen, like uh, fatal errors where we reach some unreachable or we do some unwrap that is unsafe, it, it, it logs, but is able to, to move on and process more files. All right, so that's like a, like a bonus. Uh, I mean, if you, have a, if you dealt with the internal mutability, you know, you know the tricks, but essentially, so we have this workspace, it's a trait. Uh, it's, the actual foundation uh, of Biome, we use it to make it work in the CLI and the LSP. So both use the same um, uh, trait. And so the thing is, this trait has to like go in multiple threads and multiple threads should be able to share the same information. How do we do that? So usually you do it uh, using two tricks. One is the arc mutex and the other one is the, the lock. When do, you, when, when do you use one or the other? So usually you want to use the arc mutex when you will deal with functions that have here mute self or a, a mutable reference to self. Because uh, when you actually extract the, the inner function, it actually gives you a mutable reference, but if the function doesn't have the signature, the, the compiler is going to complain. So in this case, we have to use the lock. So the lock has the same uh, poisoning mechanism of the, of the mutex, uh, but with the lock, you actually lock the resource. So you're actually able to uh, get uh, a mutable reference, even though you actually have here uh, reference to self. And I also want to show you an example of we do it. So we have this workspace server, all right? Uh, is a type that implements eventually the, um, the workspace. And we have these settings. So the settings uh, are essentially our configuration. The reason why we have the lock is because uh, when you have the LSP, you might open uh, your configuration file and change it. So we have to update it. And that's why there's a lock. So you have to actually lock it, do uh, modify it, and then release the lock. 
successfully. And that's the actual function. So, uh, so the lock gives you two functions usually. The, the, it gives you a, a read and gives you a write. So the read gives you um, a reference and the write gives you a mutable reference. You have to unwrap it. Uh, and if it throws an error, it means that some thread poisoned or, well, something went wrong among threads. And then we we set to, uh, settings to be mutable, and and we we do it. So we can actually do it. And when the, the scope ends, the lock the lock is released, and everything goes as expected. And that's how we solved it. So well, there's no science. It's one of the others. <laughs> it depends on the use cases. I think I'm done. So. Maybe your title. Yeah, I can do. Yeah. So anyway, so these are uh, some links if you're interested. So as the project, uh, come on Discord if you want. There's a GitHub, some personal links, my email if you want to, uh, I don't know, chat about it or if you have any questions. But also Discord is fine. Uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> if you want to do the screen link in there, maybe URL, you can put it up there and we'll see what happens. Uh, bear with us here while we try something. So, okay, so the demo is about uh, the formatter that we saw. Okay, so is it big enough? Yeah, let me fix that. Can't be seen lot if it's in here. Okay, so I have a couple of projects. I have a couple of projects. So the first one is the TypeScript. Uh, repository okay so is the guy so type C does have a lot of files but it has a bunch of files that are really big there's a file called checker dot yes that is like two megs uh, and it's it's abysmal <laughs> you know it <laughs> yeah <laughs> the, the whole the whole uh, type check happens there so <laughs> so I just want to show you, um, we're going to try to format the code base, OK? So I, I'm going to tell the, the CLI to ignore files that you can't handle. We're going to write the files, and we're going to put this, uh, increase this limit, because as I told you, there's a, that big files that we, we want to try to format, OK? Done. It actually formatted. I want to show you. Like, uh, if we do git status, they've been modified. Like, <laughs> it, it actually worked. It 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 formatted uh, uh, six hundred fifty-five files in 
less than half a second. That's the same kind of reaction time that Rolf has when I run it. It's just yeah. like you're kind of like... Yes, <laughs> yes. It's, uh, like the first times I were using it with my colleague were like, uh, did it actually work? <laughs> Does it work? And for every like, what, five seconds? Yeah. So here's another example. So uh, this is Ant Design. Uh, I'm not sure if you know it. It's uh, a component library, quite um, React component library, I think. It's quite big. It has a lot of components. Uh, they use actually Biome internally, so it's a uh, Biome.json somewhere. Okay, so but since they use it, what I'm gonna do, uh, I'm gonna change the formatting. Okay, so to actually show you that it actually happens. So um, as before, I'm gonna know files that we can't handle. We do the right, and we're gonna change the line width, the indentation width. Okay. That's it. 2,200 files in uh, like uh, <laughs> 200 milliseconds. So this is actually just a warning because we deprecated uh, this option. And uh, I mean, uh, sorry, I need to actually, so look at status. They were actually formatted. So, <laughs> so that's actually the demo real quick. <laughs> Yeah. So <laughs> it's Thanks fast. very much, Manuel. Uh, I've just asked: Is there anybody got um, questions that are remote? Does anybody here have any questions for Manuel? Uh, what was the question, Jacob? <laughs> <laughs> you have rough. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, Biome for now wants to fo uh, focus on the on the web, so yeah. JavaScript, CSS, <laughs> JSON. Markdown, yeah. Now for that, uh, you go with rough. Yeah. What, what, what is your scope? Like you want to lean on format, and that's it. So I'm just going to repeat the questions here. For so the question was, do what's the scope of the ambition for biome? Is it just lint and format? Is it? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm well. Biome was born to have a really big scope, like uh, lint format, type check, testing, bundling. So Time check is in your score? <laughs> <laughs> no, so uh, Biome uh, is actually a fork of Rome. So now there's a new leadership, a new, new members. And now we actually want to focus uh, more on linting. So we actually want to create more rules uh, to increase the database, essentially. Uh, we are, now we are working also on the CSS parser. Uh, so we want to manage to support multiple languages, more languages. Now it's just TypeScript, JavaScript, TSS and JSX, JSON and JSONC. So CSS will probably be the next. Uh, we actually started working on the roadmap, the actual team. So we are crafting what we want to do. Uh, one of the members is actually quite interested in uh, TypeScript isolated uh, uh, declarations. Uh, so he wants to create something around it. Not sure what, but this TypeScript uh, uh, behind that. Um, I want to focus on transformations. So have uh, the not JSX and transform it to, to JavaScript. Uh, so that's something that I really want to do. And there's also another idea uh, that I have to discuss with uh, the other members is to actually have a, a runner. Like Biome is a tool chain. So uh, we should be able also to run other tools. Like uh, you don't want to use Biome's for Matter, that's fine. We're going to run it. We're going to run Prettier for you because we're able to actually use multi-threading. And I mean, Prettier is able to do a lot of stuff, but it's slow. So if we're able to speed it up, that's uh, also a nice thing. So, as you are parsing the document, and you said that you kind of do optimistically, that example you had of the a equals f b and the comma was missing. That like there's that could have been maybe no quotes, or they meant to double escape. How do you know? Do, do you let the the user know that you've kind of taken a heuristic, or you've kind of went, oh, we think this is what you meant? Uh, well, the thing is, um, yeah, we just do our heuristic uh, based on the context. So when we parse 
uh, we actually have a bunch of contexts uh, based on, I don't know, the language or what we were actually parsing. And based on that, we try to guess okay. because it's a guess game. Um, thing is, we're actually proud of the errors and the suggestions because we think we're actually better of what, I don't know, Chrome or V8 okay, or not yeah, yeah. gives you. You know, it actually gives you an expected token and that's it. Okay. Uh, you don't even know what happened, you know. Uh, so we try to, to suggest, and even though if the suggestion isn't right, it's a hint, you know, to tell the user, listen, that's what we, we were expecting, so you should do that. Or okay. So that's uh, our goal. And as a follow-up to that then, and this may be silly, but if, if you make an assumption of what that was supposed to be, can you get cascading errors, or is it bounded to that, that line of syntax? Uh, actually, you are actually able to have a cascading errors uh, thanks to the recovery. Okay. So, I don't know, you have a while without normal brackets, but then you have uh, curly brackets. Okay, so you get the error of missing brackets, and then inside the, the body, uh, you have more code that is actually broken. We are actually able to resume parsing of the while. We have the body uh, of the while, and then we we're able to actually emit new errors if there's a, some broken mm -hmm. syntax. Yeah, that's impressive. Yeah. Uh, that's it. Anybody else here? Uh, there was a slide where you were parsing a JSON object. And there was some part that was parsing comments. Were those comments inside the JSON? Because I don't understand it. Uh, okay, so um, uh, yeah, maybe I missed that part. Okay, so comments. Uh, uh, are usually attached to a node. So when we parse everything, uh, comments are usually, they're called trivia, as I said. You know, so things that aren't important. Oh, it's not the, in the object itself, so it's... Yeah, exactly. So we have a node uh, or a token, and we attach uh, this trivia uh, to a token or a node. Mm. We have a distinction. We have a trailing, com trailing trivia and leading trivia. So there's a, an actual heuristic a rule to say when uh, it's a, tri a trailing trivia and when to which to, uh, node belongs to. So when we are navigating the red tree with our APIs, you can actually get uh, the trivia or also like the comments, even white spaces if you, if you need. Like uh, we actually do a lot of trivia work uh, in our linter because we try to, when we apply a code suggestion, we try to fix an error. Uh, we want to emit a code that is actually nice to see, you know, not something garbage all, all together. So we actually try to take the trivia that belong to a token and move them to the new token or add the new ones. So, and that's actually uh, the downside of the CST because you have to work with trivias, and working with trivias is actually quite painful, uh, and it takes a lot of time, so uh, that happened uh, quite often. So we are we're actually trying to see if we're able to create some nicer APIs to work around them. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a pain, but that's how we do it, yeah. There's only one comment from the audience that I have note, that is that they love Biome from Super Chupa. So ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, new maintainer of the of the of the project. Ah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we have anything else online, so we might just wrap it up. Friendly is still online. We have another talk next month from Pradar, who's Charlie's friend from Ruff. Um, it's our last talk of the year. There's going to be no talk in December, and we have a tentative one lined up for twenty four, which is someone from the Rust team talking to us about the roadmap for twenty four. But it's not definite yet. But we'll be here this time next month. Bring your friends, bring more people, free beer, all that. <laughs> uh, thanks, Manuel. Great presentation. Yeah, thanks for having Thank me. you. No problem. <laughs> See everybody online.